So the other day, one of you guys reminded me in a comment that I still haven't actually told the story that I promised you years ago about my strange psychic stalker who I still have the demented emails from, and I thought, oh my god, it's a perfect time, it's the spooky orange lead up to Halloween, and uh, I should finally give you this very, a very odd tale about the time that I went to a goth club wearing a Twilight Alchemy Lab love perfume, <laughs> and I didn't think it would really do anything, but it led someone I knew who who seemed only a little bit crazy, only as crazy as your average goth, he suddenly went mad, becoming convinced that we had this powerful psychic link and my psychic presence was constantly all over him, curled up on his lap, telling him that I loved him, all of this. Nothing I said would convince him otherwise. And it, it got quite scary and I actually didn't go out anywhere in the city for a very long time, mostly because I was so worried about, okay, what, what the fuck happens with this demented person now? So I guess I will begin the tale. Yes, I've been, I've been compiling a list of quotes from the emails because these emails are big. He used to call them letters and believe me, they were letters. They were pages long and the detail into which he went about like a five minute interaction or something was really very strange. So okay, first of all, I knew this guy, I'd known him for about a year for, for the sake of giving him a name, let's call him Stan, shall we? <laughs> um, although this this was this was like way before YouTube or anything, this, this wasn't like some kind of weird, weird person I'd never met before, this was a guy I met completely normally at a goth club I think a few months, maybe even a year before he really kind of went crazy. Um, so he was in his sort of mid fifties, which isn't that abnormal for that club and isn't really abnormal for the goth scene and isn't abnormal for me to have friends that age. Um, but the thing I started to realize was a little bit strange about him was that, you know, you see someone in their sort of mid fifties and they're at a club and they're pretty well dressed. They're quite attractive. They're quite personable. They're easy to chat to. They seem like a normal, nice rounded person. You would assume by that point in their life that they would have something around them. You know, they would maybe have a wife, an ex-wife, some children even, at least, you know, some long-term partners and certainly some long-term friends, maybe a job, there they would be settled in their life like a like a little hamster in a bedding you know and this guy Stan was not um I gradually came to learn that no 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 sort of no wife no ex-wife no no long-term ex-girlfriends no children no real family members no real friendship group he didn't have a job due to ill health but seemed to spend most of his time in gambling casinos, playing poker, um, but even through that hadn't really developed any friendship group. And I only really discovered the extent of his isolation when we'd gotten chatting, uh, and I'd said several times, are you not on Facebook? And he'd said, no, I don't have Facebook. Um, and you know, you think fair enough, some people take a stand, they don't want to be on Facebook. But eventually he joined Facebook, and for a long time his only friend on Facebook was me. And when he started adding other friends on Facebook, they never came from his own life. They all came from my life. And all of them were sort of my age or younger. He was also adding my friends in America who, you know, he had nothing in common with and was never going to meet. But they had a common thread in that they were all young, attractive females, which was a little bit creepy coming from this kind of older, older, very isolated guy. But I think I just assumed goth scene. <laughs> you know, if you've been around the goth scene for a while, you know most of us are a little bit peculiar. You do meet a lot of slightly peculiar people on the goth scene, but in general they are just, just harmless oddballs. <laughs> but the first sign I got that maybe he was a little bit more than your garden variety goth peculiarity was this one night at the goth club, which was a few months actually before he really went crazy at Halloween. Just a normal night at the goth club. And you know, as you do, as I'd been getting ready, putting my makeup on, I'd thought, oh, I wonder who's going to be there. And I thought, oh, 
I bet Stan will be there. So when I got there and I saw him, one of the completely offhand things I said was, oh, I had a feeling you might be here tonight. Not not really a comment that you would think, wow, that means something. But um, anyway, you know, the night went on, normal, normal. When I get home, he has kind of left me a Facebook comment saying, uh, do you have an email address? I need to write you a letter. Um, and I said, well, like, dude, Facebook message? He was like, no, I, I want to write you a letter. So I was like, okay, fine, here's my email address. And I'm really glad I did that because now I still have all of these messages. He, in his first letter, he said, ah, the reason you said I had a feeling you were coming tonight was that I'm psychic. And, uh, and he didn't, the thing was, he didn't come out with it in this really braggy, boastful way, because yes, you do meet people on the goth scene, usually younger ones, admittedly, who think that being a bit spooky and having some kind of weird wizard power that they've completely pulled out of their arse um, is going to, to give them huge amounts of credibility on the goth scene that ooh, I'm like some kind of level 25 warlock and I can meditate my, my arse onto my big toe. You know, all, all these things. You do sometimes get this sort of thing spouted off on the goth scene. I've not heard this kind of nonsense for a while. Maybe we're all growing out of it, but I'm sure it's still there. So when you usually hear people go on about it in this really braggy way, you just know this is a very insecure person who is essentially a compulsive liar on steroids. But um, the way he talked about it wasn't like that. It was like this kind of reluctant secret. It was like, yes, yeah, so you know, I don't tell many people this. Um, and actually being psychic is really annoying. That it's actually really crippled my life in many ways. That, you know, if I'm on a bus or something and someone goes past me, I they're in my head and they can be in my head for like the rest of the journey. If I make friends via online poker and they're in Australia, sometimes they're in my head and it's, it's very hard to know whose thoughts are mine and keep my mind straight and all of this, which, sounded kind of concerning. But yeah, the initial reason he had told me this was that he believed perhaps we might have some kind of psychic link that I might be one of the people who was getting stuck in his head because he had felt this calling to go to the goth club and when I said, oh, I was wondering if you were there, he realised the calling was coming from me and I'd been thinking of him and wanting him to be at the goth club, and therefore he felt this pull and he came to the club. Um, so he, he explains all of this, and actually he went on to explain a hell of a lot more about psychic links that he'd had with always women in the past, um, and he made it sound like these women had actually been in a relationship with him, that it had been this relationship that had become so deep that they'd actually developed a psychic connection and when they parted after like a night together he would still feel them in his head and they'd be able to like chat and things in his head and sometimes they would do you know sex and stuff in his head but it was all reciprocal and it was two-way and it was a genuine link and at that point I thought okay he's, I didn't believe it but I thought okay he's talking about an ex-girlfriend I now wonder whether these women had no real relationship with him at all and all of it was completely in his imagination because that's kind of the way it went with me. But um yeah, so you know, this this whole this whole email and I I basically got back to him and said uh, you know, I didn't want to completely shit on his beliefs and just say, I'm sorry, mate, I think you're fucking nuts. Uh, but I equally didn't want to completely entertain all of this as well. So I kind of said, well, I don't really believe in this thing as a rule, but, um, you know, I guess everyone's different. I guess anything's possible. But I did make it very clear that, you know, I personally, I am not psychic. So kind of to reassure him, I said, I'm not psychic, I will never be in your head. So I felt like I'd done my bit in saying, you know, okay, you're you're welcome to your beliefs, but, you know, keep them in the corner, mate. I don't really want anything to do with them because they uh, sound a bit whack. Um, <laughs> so things kind of potted along quite normally, I thought, for a while, that, you know, he wasn't talking about this psychic link, he wasn't sending me letters. And, uh, and the only thing was that I had had to clarify that I wanted to be in the friendship category with him because he... he 
fixated on this a lot later, his, his idea of categories. He liked to put people in categories, girlfriend category, friend category, God knows what other categories, but um, he, he had clearly assumed that something was brewing between us and I, I did have to kind of say to him in person, no, I just want to be friends. No, I, I only see us as friends. That's all it's going to be. And I thought I'd been pretty clear about that. And that was that. And everything ticked along until the night that I wore the love perfume. So <laughs> this is um, Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab, who I'm always talking about. They have a sister company called Twilight Alchemy Lab, which is kind of magical ritual blends, uh, which I, I have a few of and I've used for various things. But um, I had a little decant of one called Amour, and, um, yeah, which is this kind of love blend. So I thought I am going to wear it on one of the nights coming up to Halloween. I thought I'm going to wear it and I honestly didn't want it to affect people around me. I was hoping it would act on me and make me a bit more open-minded towards people with flaws because I am pretty much asexual when it comes to actually finding other human beings attractive. And I was getting a bit frustrated with it. I was like, right, I'm going to wear this with the intent of opening my mind to people. And, uh, and I went to the club and I saw Stan and everything seemed normal. You know, we had a fine night. I talked to loads of people, had a dance. I danced with him. I danced with other people. Everything was normal. I went home <laughs> and then I started getting letters. So I've collected some of the more brilliant quotes from these letters. And first of all, I'm going to have to leap back in the timeline slightly to one of his very first letters when he was initially revealing his psychic powers and talking about this psychic link that he thought we were developing. Um, he said, I can't spy on you. But two days ago, I felt a oneness with someone when I woke up. I didn't know it was you, but I quickly did an equation, which was me, one, plus one, plus zero, equals Dorian. Where one was you, and zero was the probability of it being anyone else at that time. It could only have been you! So then he went on and talked a little bit about these, these early psychic link interactions we had. Yesterday you got up early and were focused on other things and I didn't sense you. You're not spying on me at all here are you? Um, this morning I woke up and felt the weight of a presence attached to me. I looked and recognised you immediately. You were comfortable enough with me to curl up securely with me but something happened yesterday that caused you to put some distance between us. Possibly you're worrying over me being psychic. <laughs> Just so you know, things are equal. If I wasn't happy to have you with me when I woke up, I'd have dumped you out of my head and woken you up at the same time, probably. So, I mean, that's really reassuring to know, obviously, that, you know, he, he psychically loves me back because, I mean, I love to give these mixed messages, you know, tell people in person, no, I definitely don't want to have a relationship with you. No, I just want to be friends. But, but you know, then I like to astrally project and crawl into bed with people and, and curl up like a, like a strange psychic cat. And I would have been very hurt if he'd flung my psychic body off the bed or something. <laughs> so he then goes on to say, um, talking about uh, my psychic awarenesses and the fact that I've said, dude, I'm not psychic. It's not going to be me in your head. He said, um, yeah, you're not quite there yet, but let's, let's keep trying these things. Tomorrow morning, if you feel my presence, try answering me or speaking with me. Once you are aware of me, you will have more power. We can speak to each other. You can do all the affectionate stuff I have mentioned earlier. I don't want to do the affectionate stuff. He then went on to say, I was feeling a bit insecure, not having heard from you in one day. Um... I was so pleased and reassured to find you curled up snugly with me. Oh, dude, you're creeping me out now. So, okay, now we are back in time to after the love potion. And this was when I got the biggest letter of all. And uh, all of it was as he said, deconstructing Saturday night at Eddie's. He says, I am glad I waited another day before completing this letter, doing it with a clear head because dear God, did he go on and on. Um, he said, I was delighted when I saw you and snuck up on you to surprise you. When you saw it was me, you said, oh, 
to yourself. I made to come off the dance floor, but you were dancing to the sisters, Lucretia, I think, and I wanted to dance too, and psychically sent so. So you turned back, going with the flow, while trying to work out where the flow was going, neatly repositioning your bag, demonstratively, to show that this was what you intended all along. Blew you a kiss, in case that bit makes you feel insecure, but there is no need. It was skillfully done. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about, mate? Like, I saw you, I went, oh, oh, okay, it's you, and I carried on dancing. I maybe moved my bag with, with one foot so that there was room for you. Why are you reading a whole paragraph in, in, into, into this? What? What? Um, he, he goes on and on and on to say, Dancing away, I notice how happy you are. When you notice I'm looking at you, you put on a poker face. Later analysis. Later I described it to myself as defensive, but then decided attentive would be more accurate. <laughs> Later, I start analysing how you look against my desires and think you look beautiful and attractive sexually. <laughs> I'm surprised I'm looking and analysing. But the giveaway is when I try and stop, I feel a pressure to continue doing so. In other words, he's saying I was psychically pressuring him to keep analysing how fucking hot I am or something. Um, the analysis was mine, beautiful and sexually attractive, but you actually seem to be glowing, trick of the light or my psychic sense. But the urge to analyse you was external. I started to feel uncomfortable, well, naturally, because I was psychically pressuring him into this, this weird position, and if you believe in the love potion doing anything, maybe this is what it was doing, but I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of borderline about whether I believe in ritual oils or not, but after this, I will say I have never fucking worn that oil again. Um, he said, I start wishing I was in another place. He's really getting, like, freaked out by the whole thing at this point. He said, I finally decide to go get a drink. Then when I'm at the bar, I regret not letting you know where I was going. The bar staff are slow and I start worrying. I'm being away too long. Feeling like I've been away too long, I go back without a drink. And then he says in capitals, STOP SCRIPT ADD ANALYSIS. And then there's a whole big waffle about the fact that I, I left the club earlier than he expected, saying I was too tired, blah, 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 blah. You say goodbye, and after we hug and say goodbye again, you walk out, but before you get to the door, you turn and give me a sad wave, as though you didn't want to go. Current note, Wednesday. Cor, you really know how to annoy me, as if to proof we have a psychic link, no proof needed, so apparently on Wednesday I was in his head again, or in his lap, or giving him psychic blowjob, I don't even want to know. Um, so he has, he has been nice enough to bullet point the rest of this letter. Woke up and went over the events of last night. Had a great night, met you. You were very happy, due to me. Uh, it was it was Halloween and there were lots of people and I was wearing a very nice dress and things. It wasn't due to you, mate. You were a very small element in the night. I analyse how you're looking tonight. It's not my idea. I was making him analyse me for hours. I'm, I'm a psychic narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> feel uncomfortable when I don't keep the analysis going. I've had these feelings before when someone has plans for me, or worse, an expectation that I'm going to do or say something, commitment-wise. Interestingly enough, when I made similar but loose plans romantically with you several months ago, you didn't even show up. I rest my case. Psychic sense in action. I'm really lost at this point. If... Uh, if I'd been telling him, oh, come on, I fucking love you psychically, uh, so he made romantic plans, but then I didn't even show up, does it not prove that you were in your own head talking to your own, your own weird little atoms, mate? Um, <laughs> so, he says, I need notice of your romantic intentions, as you are firmly in the friend category. Because that's where I had told you I wanted to be, mate. Um, now, he says, I don't know which category I'm in with you, but it's definitely not the friend category anymore. And, uh, you know, nothing, nothing had happened between us at this point. In words, in speech, in real, real conversation. All this category changing and all of this email, all these things he thought had happened. 
who are all, all, all in his head, all, all in his funny little mind. And um, so he, he goes on to say, I have reconsidered so many times at your urging, the whole category business. Last time, at your very insistent desire, I spent a week agonising over the issue and I came to the conclusion that I see no evidence that you want a relationship. What, what, what are we still doing here? Um, you tell me you love me often, albeit psychically. Even then, there is no sign of affection, just words, so to speak. Saturday was the first time I saw any sign. While I'm reminiscing, I suddenly picture your face and kiss you on the lips. Woot! You are delighted! And that's a first. Usually you're like, what was that? Or tss, or it passes you by. For your information, you can be in the friend category and still give, receive, psychic kisses. <laughs> There was also the times when I woke up and found you were cuddled up to, on slash in me, psychically. That has to be considered a sign of affection, but your desire to stop doing it kind of counters that. When you were in the centre of me, I could get up and do things without disturbing you, but when you were over to one side it was so cute, but the weight of your presence had me lopsided and I couldn't do anything without disturbing you. You kept trying to snuggle, but I kept nudging you. You finally did an assessment of the situation and stopped attempting to snuggle. You never did again, which I regretted a lot. Your constantly wanting to hide, deny any affection from me has been a major part of firmly being in the friendship category. But of course I'm aware you love me. <laughs> I was reading this and my, my brain was just, just dribbling out of my ears in a, in a unicorn puke rainbow of amusement. Um, it's quite creepy actually to think, uh, you, you know, because you could think, okay, someone's got a crush on you in a, in a sense you don't like, someone might be having a wank over you, that's a bit creepy, but the fact that someone thinks that you are genuinely interacting with them in these ways that you're not, and they're, they're kind of taking your persona and pulling its puppet strings to do all these things that you would never do, is quite creepy. So anyway, I replied and I basically told him, this is all going on in your head. As I said before, I'm not psychic. No, I don't want to be anything more than friends. I am actually a bit worried about your mental health. Please, please go to your doctor. Please get on medication or see a therapist or something. However, once again, to get on his level, um, I said, is it possible that what you're communicating with in your head is a mischievous spirit, not me? Is it, is it some kind of mischievous entity that's communicating with you? And I said, please don't listen to anything that you think comes from me psychically. It's not me. Please keep all of our interactions and all of our dialogue in the mundane realm. Um, he then, the next two replies I got were very short and actually quite sensible. He said, I'm all for keeping communication in the mundane realm. Um, and he talked about, yes, maybe it is a mischievous spirit. But he said, as for categories, I'm afraid I'm still up in the air. At this point, I made the mistake of trying to clarify further rather than just being seriously, dude, no, blunt. Um, so I was a bit too detailed. I, I kind of went into detail. Like, Look, this is me. This is all the reasons why, A, I, I don't, I don't want to be in a relationship with you, but also B, please do not use me as this, this kind of crutch in your life. Like, I have this feeling that you are putting a lot of emotional reliance on me and I am not a good person to emotionally rely on for all of these reasons. And uh, unfortunately, he read that as, um, oh, thank you so much for opening up to me, big smiley face. Um, and uh, he went on a big ramble about not trusting medication and psychiatrists and all of these things because they don't understand him, I don't have a problem, I'm psychic and they don't believe me so I can't go to them. And again this crazy crazy email went on and the bit that worried me the most actually and that made me realise how long this had been going on for was when he said a couple of times when I've been sceptical as to whether the psychic link was with you, you posted on Facebook to let me know that it was what you were doing. And then he, he cites this random Facebook post that I'd made at Resistance, you know, months earlier. And all I had said was, you know, I've come back early. I'm in my hotel room. I'm watching Underworld and eating a bruschetta or something. That's all I'd said. 
but he believed this post had been purely directed at him to reassure him that yes yes it is me I was speaking to you psychically before and I was thinking well fuck if you got that from one email about eating a bruschetta in a hotel room what the fuck are you reading into everything else on my Facebook now at this point we were about two days away from the second Halloween event at the goth club and I was thinking fuck me well I'm obviously not missing Halloween there are two Halloween events this year it's the best thing that's ever happened to me I'm not missing it, but there is this crazy shit going on. Um, and at this point, I blocked him on Facebook. I had never blocked anybody on Facebook before then. I didn't even know how to do it. I had to fucking look in the help thing about how to block someone. Blocked him on Facebook, and I sent him a very blunt email at that point saying, Look, mate, stop it. Um, I've blocked you on Facebook because I don't want you reading these crazy things in. Nothing is happening between us. I am worried about your fucking mental health. Please stop relying on me for any of these things. Please do not contact me again. And I said, please, if you see me at the club on Halloween, do not approach me. I do not want to talk to you. Do not approach me. Um, <laughs> Halloween rolls around and I go to the club. And obviously I was kind of on edge and uh, I danced, I danced to a couple of songs, didn't see him, you know, all the time I'm kind of like rotating a little bit, keeping an eye out, didn't see him. And, uh, and then just as a song was ending, I see him approaching me. So I kind of do an about turn, leg it into the rock room and there was a guy, Halloween, everyone dressed up, a guy dressed as a baby. I didn't fucking know this guy, but he was dressed as a baby. So that's a pretty good conversation starter. And I launch into conversation with the guy dressed as a baby. Um, and Stan is literally standing right fucking here the whole time, right? You know, and I'm like edging. So my back is to him, just trying to like be as obvious as possible that I'm shutting him out. Not paying any attention to what the guy dressed as a baby <laughs> is saying so if you're out there guy dressed as baby i'm sorry i was so fucking weird i was just trying to get rid of someone and um eventually he did get the hint and kind of disappear but um wherever i went i could just see him lurking in corners looking at me and i left after 40 fucking minutes 40 minutes just less time than it took to get ready and uh and i went home so completely just botulismed my halloween and uh and when i got home there's another fucking letter um and he said he went on and on and on about a whole load of stuff but the main thing he said was um i ended up giving you too much space because he, he said he got uncomfortable again about the level of intensity between us i ended up giving you too much space and making you uncomfortable at which point uh, i completely fucking flipped my lid at that point <laughs> and uh uh, I sent him the rudest email I've any, ever sent anybody. I don't like to be horribly rude to people. Actually, British politeness is very ingrained. But, um, you know, I said I wasn't uncomfortable because you were giving me too much space. I was uncomfortable because I told you not to come anywhere near me. You're freaking me out. I never want to speak to you again. Please go away. I am considering talking to the police. Go away. Didn't hear anything else from him after that. However, a lunatic that you don't hear from is kind of scarier actually because at least if you're getting crazy communications you know what they're thinking whereas when they take that level of obsession that clearly has been running for months and months and months and you shut them down that hard what happens after that um and as a result yeah i didn't i didn't go out into town for several months after this i you know i had to tell multiple friends who you know who he'd friend added in america and more importantly kind of girls i knew who he'd friend added here um I, you know and most of them were like oh shit um and uh you know and he sort of got i think gradually kind of excommunicated from people but i you know i hadn't told people unfriend him he's evil get rid of him i'd said i think he is mentally unstable if you do want to stay as friend that might be a good thing because honestly i think he needs someone but uh it can't be me it can't be me this is getting too weird and i actually had tickets to see the pretty reckless about a month or two after that and i knew he had tickets too because we discussed it together and i think he'd got the tickets because i was going and uh and i thought about going and in the end i didn't go 
And if I was going to go, I'd actually printed off a picture of him that I was going to bring with me and show to the bouncers and say, if you see this guy, I don't know if he's come in yet, but if you see him, can you just keep a fucking eye on him? Can you make sure he hasn't got a weapon? Because he's crazy. <laughs> he's, he's got this thing about me. Um, but in the end, I was just so fucking anxious about the whole thing that I didn't go. So I missed seeing the Pretty Reckless um, and, and various other, other events after that. And I haven't seen him since. No one has seen him since. So I hope he's okay. I hope he didn't like just go off and kill himself or something after that. I really don't know. So that's the, the slightly potentially dark ending to this story is that I have no idea what happened to him after that. Whether he went crazy, whether he ended up in a lunatic asylum, whether he died, whether whether he is still off doing these, these crazy things to someone, or whether it was actually a wake-up call for him and he realised, I need to get help and maybe he's fine now. Maybe he's like a fucking accountant now. I don't know, but... Uh, go so that is my my halloween stalker story and uh if i come up with any other creepy things to read in the in the months leading up to, to halloween then i'll i'll give you them but i don't know anyway if you've got any crazy stories about about psychics or stalkers or just weird fucking people you've met on the goth scene uh, please tell me them <laughs> bye bye